All right, gang, it is Wednesday. That means we're going to talk about the Bible for a few minutes. And uh, it's been a few weeks since we've done this, but we're going to jump right back into where we were. We are talking about uh, the nature of God, particularly this um, thing that we've noticed in the book of Exodus, at least as a starting point. That's where we're at in the book of Exodus that ties God's character, who God is at his um, core to this notion of hearing the cry of the oppressed and uh, answering that cry that comes out of the brokenness of the world for the sake of redemption. And we've traced this through a variety of places, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament as we go. Uh, it's the fundamental move of the Exodus story. And if you want to listen to or catch up on all of that, you can go back and you can listen to the past week videos, not very long, usually 20, 25 minutes, and uh, you will be caught up. So uh, before we get started, I want to remind you this is obviously not recorded live. Um, it's pre-recorded, but even at that, you can leave questions, comments, additions, subtractions, complaints, compliments, reflections in the comment section of this video, either on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, I am not on Facebook as a rule a whole lot these days. I usually check in once or twice a week, but if you leave a comment there, I probably will at some point see it. And uh, we can engage in it, the conversation. It's just a little slower than the speed of social media usually, which is not all in all a bad thing. <clears throat> so we um, have been talking about this development of this notion of crying out of the darkness. And God being fundamentally the God who is present, who answers that cry. And we want to talk more about that as we go along next week. Particularly, we're going to talk about the Psalms. And uh, some things that I've been studying uh, from the theologian Walter Brueggemann and going to be good, good stuff there. But today I just want to throw two more texts out, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, to kind of develop this theme a little more deeply. The first one comes in um, Genesis chapter 21. And Genesis chapter 21 is at the end of a, a longer story uh, concerning Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael and, um, of course, Isaac as well. And it goes back to um, chapter 15, 16, 17, right through there, where Abraham and Sarah have gone um, out of their home country into the promised land. They're kind of wandering as sojourners um, because God has promised to build, this goes back to chapter 12, the first couple of verses, God has promised to build a nation uh, through their lineage and has promised through that nation to bless all of the nations of the world. And at the beginning, this is a pretty amazing thing. Abraham and Sarah, uh, despite some obvious problems, they actually get up and they go. Um, the obvious problem is God promised to build a nation through their family. They don't have a family. They're too old for kids. They've never been able to have kids. So they are childless. And here is God saying, get up, go to a land uh, that I will show you when you get there. Just kind of head out and I'll let you know when you've arrived. And I will build a nation through your family. So what they're doing through the first part of the story is they're, they're um, obeying God, more or less. They've left in faith, but they're trying to figure out how God is going to do it. They're kind of limited by the possibilities. And so chapter 15, for instance, Abraham says, <clears throat> okay, I've got this figured out. You, you're going to build this nation through my family. I don't have any kids, so I think I know how this is going to work. He says there's this custom that he alludes to in Genesis 15, where if you don't have an heir, then your heir becomes um, your right-hand man, so to speak, your, your lead servant. In this case, a gentleman named Eliezer in Abraham's life becomes your heir. And so he says, okay, I figured it out. I can't have a kid. I don't have kids. I need an heir. And so by this custom, Eliezer becomes my heir. And it's through Eliezer that you're going to build this... Um, this great nation, bless all the nations of the earth. You're going to keep your promise. And God says in chapter 15, he says, no, that's not the way it's going to happen. What's going to happen is you're going to have a child. And it's going to be through the child that you have, not through your servant Eliezer, that I'm going to keep my promise. And so God enters into covenant with him in Genesis chapter 15. Uh, and so as we move past Genesis chapter 15, you see Abraham and Sarah, they're still trying to figure this out. They're still kind of mulling over, ruminating on the possibilities, okay? Um, God is going to bless all of the nations of the earth through this nation that he's going to build uh, from our family. We don't have a family, but now we know it's not Eleazar. Um, and God said that Abraham was going to have a child. And Sarah gets this idea, and she says, okay, says that... Um, 
you're going to have a child. It doesn't say anything about me. And so she says, and it's kind of uh, morally sketchy. Well, not sketchy. It's more than sketchy. Um, it's kind of morally messed up situation. She said, here is my handmaid, Hagar. And what you're going to do is you're going to take my servant and you're going to get her pregnant. And that way you will have a child. And so that child will be the one through whom God keeps his promise. And um, so Abraham takes Sarah's handmaid, gets her pregnant. And she has a son that is named Ishmael. And uh, Abraham and Sarah assume problem solved. Except for God comes to them a couple of times, chapter 17 and 18 thereabouts, and says that um, the child of promise will not be Ishmael. That what's going to happen is, even though this is Abraham's son, uh, Abraham and Sarah are going to have a child, and that is going to be the child of promise. So not Hagar, not Ishmael. And then, of course, um, Sarah becomes pregnant. Sarah gives birth to Isaac. And as we come to chapter uh, 21, down and around verse 8, this is where we kind of pick up the story. So um, Hagar and Ishmael are still a part of Abraham and Sarah's life. Now Isaac has come on the scene. And starting in verse 8 of Genesis 21, this is what it says. It says, The child grew, uh, speaking of Isaac, and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman and her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son, but God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that the offspring, that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water, and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. She departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. And then when the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. And then she wept and sat down opposite of him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. And she said, Do not let me look on the death of my child. And she sat opposite of him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, and I will make a great nation of him. And then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy to drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up, and he lived in the wilderness, and he became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. And so, <clears throat> let's trace out this kind of a weird story by our standards. Abraham and Sarah certainly don't look good in this story. Um, but Hagar finds herself, really, from the very beginning of the situation, an oppressive situation. She is a slave. She has no say in this uh, plot that Abraham and Sarah uh, concoct that involves her. She has really no say in whether or not she wants to um, give birth to Abraham's child or participate in the situation. But nonetheless, she finds herself here with her child. It's obvious that she loves her child. She cares for her child. She wants to take care of her child. But um, at the beginning of the story in verse 8 of Genesis 21, Sarah is jealous of Ishmael. And so Sarah kind of adding insult to injury in the situation where Hagar has had no voice and no power to begin with um, sends Hagar and Ishmael away. Get this child and his mama out of my sight. And so she kind of doubles down. And uh, Hagar, the slave, ironically an Egyptian, we're going to kind of turn the tables there from what we've seen in other places. Um, Hagar is completely at the mercy of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham, for his part, at least is distressed, but God essentially comes to him, and what he says is, um, he doesn't condone what Sarah is doing, but he says, Sarah is doing this thing, let Hagar and Ishmael go, I've got this. And so Abraham sends them away out into the wilderness, they're kind of exiled because of the situation. 
and uh, it reaches the point where Hagar thinks that Ishmael is going to die, so she kind of leaves him off to the side, and she goes away because she says, I don't want to watch my boy die. The implication is that uh, the child is crying, and it states explicitly that she cries out. And then in the story, God, who has already promised to provide for them, uh, God demonstrates, again, this character of who he is. Um, you know, notice he didn't say to Abraham and Sarah, what you're doing is a good thing. He just said, know that I'm going to take care of Hagar and Ishmael while you're doing this thing. And he hears their cry and he provides for them. And as the story goes along, God walks with him. They, he provides for them liberation from this situation that they find themselves in. They were in a position where they were, um, in a very real way, um, what sword I'm looking for here? A very real way they were, they were victims of Abraham and Sarah's sin. From the very beginning, they were victims of Abraham and Sarah's sin, and God provides them liberation from the effects of Abraham and Sarah's sin. He walks with them, He blesses them. This is the same thing that we saw in the Exodus narrative when the script is flipped. God hears the cry. He enters into the darkness, and He answers that cry. And he brings redemption and liberation. This is um, who God is. This is what we see God doing. Again and again, we're going to drive this point. This is this is who God is. This is what it means, he would say in the book of Exodus, for God to be the I am. And so I wanted to put that one on the radar just for you to wrestle with. There's some complexities there. But the basic story, um, God hearing the cry, God answering the cry, God bringing redemption, the basic story is still there. God is... Uh, telling us this is um, an essential part of who I am. Now, the other one that I wanted to talk about today, and we're just kind of skipping around. We're not doing this in a very systematic way. Um, The other one that I want to talk about today is uh, the text that we talked about last Sunday in uh, our time together on Sunday. But I didn't talk about this part because I want to talk about it today. Today is Epiphany, right? Um... Epiphany is, in the Christian calendar, the moment where we commemorate the coming of the Magi to Jesus. And we talked kind of last time about how the Magi were outsiders. They would have been looked down upon, but yet they were the ones showing up to worship Jesus. But I want to focus a little more on the overall shape of the story that uh, Matthew is telling here and and highlight a different point. Uh, I think we've mentioned this in passing before, but I want to spend a little more time talking about it. Um, the Magi come looking for Jesus and they don't know exactly where to go and so they go to Jerusalem and they talk to the king. Uh, It seems like an obvious move for them, not so smart of a move from our perspective, but they go to the king and they say, okay, the king of the Jews has been born. We want to to pay homage to the king of the Jews. And so where was the king born? And so the wise men in Jerusalem and the scribes, they all start searching scripture and they say, it's going to be in Bethlehem. This is where uh, the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. And so they go to Bethlehem Uh, But as they go to Bethlehem to pay homage to the new king, the existing king, Herod the Great, he sees this as a threat, um, as he would. Uh, This is a threat to his power, to his dynasty, to his family, to their position. You um, don't just go around talking about the new king being born to the uh, existing king, especially not somebody as wicked as Herod. And so uh, he says to the wise men who came from the east, the magicians, uh, the wizards, Harry, um... He says to the magicians, he says, once you find him, let me know where he is so I can go pay homage to him as well. But of course, that's not uh, what's going to happen. What happens is rather uh, this chapter of the Christmas story is actually pretty important, but we actually usually ignore it because it doesn't fit in with kind of our Thomas Kincaid, Norman Rockwell notions of Christmas. Um, Is that rather what he does is he goes sends troops to the area around Bethlehem and all of the boys who fit within the certain age of this child that the wise men are coming to see um, he slaughters them it's kind of a genocide this is um, the slaughter of the innocents they call it Um, and Abraham or Abraham still in the Old Testament Joseph and Mary are only able to save Jesus because of the intervening um, command from an angel tells them to get up this is all Matthew chapter 2, by the way. Um, tells them to get up and go into Egypt. There's some deep ironies there as well, where it's the 
Israelites who present the existential threat to the Son of God, and so to flee the oppression of the Israelites, um, they take refuge in Egypt. And the Egyptians are actually the good guys in this part of the story because they give refuge to uh, Joseph and Mary and Jesus. But what the text says in Matthew chapter 2 explicitly is, and it, and it draws on this... Um, draws on this imagery from from the Exodus story um, it says that the <clears throat> it says the mothers of the area around Bethlehem they cry out in their darkness um, it, it quotes from this text from Jeremiah a voice was heard this is verse 18 of Matthew chapter 2 a voice was heard in Ramah wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled because they are no more. You can imagine, you know, if you think about that, uh, you can imagine mothers grieving this situation, and it happens in too many situations still today. But at the end of Matthew chapter 2, we have this story of, um, much like the Exodus story, of utter darkness, of... Um, of oppression and pain and violence. You have this king, and the king was always meant to represent God and to kind of bring his justice and his peace and his righteousness to bear on the people that he um, was meant to serve. This king who, instead of representing God, has done this heinous thing, who has brought darkness and despair. And these mothers who are wailing inconsolably at the uh, death of their children. The situation is one we, we kind of leave it hanging in Matthew chapter 2. Uh, this cry coming out of the darkness. And it is, uh, as we go to Matthew chapter 3, it is this situation out of which comes the beginning of Jesus' ministry, out of which becomes God's action in the world. And um, the Exodus ties are throughout this entire thing. Matthew is wanting us to see Jesus as kind of a new Moses, and that's going to be obvious Um as you go through the Gospel of Matthew. But the, the idea here is that Jesus' ministry is a response to the cry that comes out of the darkness in Matthew chapter 2. We have here the first two chapters of Matthew a story about a world that is utterly broken and out of that darkness those who are affected by the brokenness their cry goes up to the Lord. And so just like in Exodus from Matthew chapter 3 all the way through we now have God coming into the darkness and God confronting the powers over that darkness. That is what the cross is going to be. The cross and the resurrection of where Jesus does battle against the forces of darkness, death and sin and Satan and all their minions where all of the brokenness of the world kind of comes to a fine point in the cross and it looks like God is lost as he came to fight that uh, brokenness with his love. But his love wins in the resurrection his love is bigger than death. His power is bigger than death. He comes into the darkness. He takes on the powers over that darkness. And out of that conflict comes redemption, liberation. And so Matthew is setting up his entire gospel in Matthew chapter 2. Kind of with this opening episode of Epiphany where the Magi come and, and pay homage to Jesus, but they have hair drawn into this and all of the evil that comes. Setting up the entire gospel as a retelling of the Exodus story in which the cry goes up and God hears the cry. And God answers the cry. And uh, as God answers the cry, what he does, just like in Exodus, is he goes head to head with the powers that be. He defeats the powers that be. Even the word gospel. Uh, it was not a religious term in the ancient world. It was a term for uh, the good news. It was political or military, the good news of victory, right? Jesus goes against the powers. He defeats the powers. Uh, one ancient way of looking at uh, what Jesus accomplished on the cross was in Latin called Christus Victor. Christ is victorious. He has um, defeated the powers over the darkness. He has defeated Satan in Hebrews chapter 2 who who holds the keys to death that keeps us enslaved to the fear of death. Hear that language there as well. We were enslaved to the fear of death, and he has redeemed us. He has liberated us from slavery to the fear of death. Um, 
Jesus goes to battle with the powers that be, wins a victory, and out of that victory become, comes our liberation. And so what I'm wanting you to see as you go through just this, I mean, really brief survey of some just key text, you know, talking about Matthew, Matthew, and we've talked some about Revelation, and we're talking about, um, you know, Psalm 22, and talking about a couple of places in Exodus and a couple of places in Genesis. We talk about all of these um, as we continue on. I want you to start to get this sense, to kind of start stewing in this notion that this is the central aspect of who God is. This is what God does in the world. And it's not just in the Exodus, and it's not <clears throat> just in the cross. He did it in the life of Hagar as well. Uh, we see him doing it in Revelation as well. God is the God who concerns himself with the cry of those who are oppressed by the brokenness of their world. And he answers that cry. He, he's attentive to that cry. He is present. That is what it means to be the I am. And so, um, so to make the practical turn one more time, if this is who God is, what does that mean for us? And depending on where we are in our lives, it can mean a variety of things. It may be a deeply comforting thing where we say, uh, God hears me as I cry out of my darkness. Or God hears us as we cry out of our darkness. And certain situations in the last 12 months certainly have given us plenty of reasons to, to cry out. And many of us have and many of our loved ones have. And God is not deaf to those cries. Um, God is not uninterested in our cries in such situations. But also, we want to bear in mind that in each of these situations, there are those who cause those who cry to do that crying. Um, Hagar cried because of Abraham and Sarah. The Israelites cried because of the Egyptians. Uh, the mothers in and around Bethlehem cried out because of um, Herod and what he did, so on, so on and so forth. And what the biblical story tells us is that when God answers that cry, he comes in, he goes to battle with the forces that cause that crying. And so while on the one side we would always say, and this was true in the Gospels, we see it explicitly as Jesus indiscriminately reaches out to those in his life, in the life of the early church, as they indiscriminately reach out to everybody they come across. God always holds, holds open the possibility that um, the oppressor can be redeemed as well as the oppressed. But the thing that is clear is that God is going to stand against your oppression. And so it could be that we find ourselves in a situation where the way we live our lives or deliberate actions we take up or actions that we take up where we haven't even really thought about it, but the effect is still there. We are the ones causing people to cry out. And as Christians, what we want to wrestle with is that God will um, stand against that. We want to make sure that if we're going to pick sides, we stand on the side of those who are oppressed rather than those who are oppressing. And that doesn't give us license, by the way, to, we could talk about this. Um, it doesn't give us license, by the way, to, to go oppress the oppressors. Um, a lot of our talk about choosing love instead of hate these days um, is a, a way of talking about a form of love that only extends to those that we want to love. We have the command to love those who... To, love those who hurt us as well and so it doesn't give us license to oppress oppressors but we want to be the people who say mm, you know we're not going to be a part of this oppression thing because God has very clearly shown that in the brokenness of the world he's going to answer the cry of those who cry out of that oppression and that usually um, <clears throat> doesn't speak of good things for those who are doing the oppressing and so it is um perhaps a moment of liberation for us if we are uh, the ones crying out of the broken. This is also a moment of repentance for us if we are the ones who are causing people to cry out, which is its own form of liberation. But this is what God is doing in the world. And so we might ask a question, you know, who are those who are crying out in our world, in our context, in our, our situation? Who are the people like Hagar and Ishmael? Who are the people like the Israelites in Egypt? Who are the people in our context who are like the women who are crying out because of the loss of their children in Bethlehem and um, then why are they crying and then how can we join God in answering their cries um, that may be serving them it may be changing our lives so that we don't make them cry anymore but if this is who God is we want to follow God into the world in real 
and uh, practical and concrete ways. Because this, as I hope you're starting to see, is not some um, slight second level kind of esoteric theme in Scripture. This is pretty core to what's going on with God in the world. Okay, so one more time, not live, pre-recorded, not on social media a lot, but if you leave a comment, uh, I would love for you to do that. We will catch that and we will go from there. Until then, we're going to let you go for now. Next week, we're going to talk about Walter Brueggemann and the Psalms, um, and I'm going to do my best not to butcher uh, Walter Brueggemann because he's got some good stuff to say. Uh, but until then, we will uh, talk to you later. Hope you have a good week. Bye, guys.